Thank you. Uh, the purpose of these two talks is to give some background and context for uh, the work of Carriol on arithmetic um, automorphic forms. And the first talk today will uh, really be a general background talk, uh, somewhat historical, and trying to, uh, if you like, set a context for uh, the work of Carriol. Uh, Carriol's work draws from uh, multiple strands. Uh, if you trace it back, it draws from uh, geometry, uh, complex analytic geometry, algebraic geometry, integral geometry, uh, from representation theory, uh, and also, of course, from uh, arithmetic, of which I'm not an expert. Uh, in a very interesting way to me, all of these strands come together in some extremely intricate uh, and ingenious calculations that Carriol carried out to draw some uh, conclusions about what I gather was a fairly mysterious object uh, dealing with the arithmetic aspects of degenerate limits of discrete series and actually holding these in one's hand in some way and seeing what their arithmetic properties are. Uh, I think his analysis consists, uh, as I said, mainly of, uh, of fairly explicit calculations. And what I hope to do today is to give some uh, general background of the strands that uh, were pulled together in these calculations. The perspective will be that really from complex analytic geometry, uh, some algebraic geometry, but mainly complex analytic geometry. Uh, representation theory, of which again I'm not really an expert, uh, but that played a, a certainly critical role historically in the development. Um, as you can see, there's 11 topics that I want to touch on, and uh, what I will do is to go through each of these and explain how they, or try to explain how they enter into the story. Uh, there's some explicit calculations, especially of examples, that I will only indicate uh, what the outcome is and explain a bit what the computations mean geometrically. I made some notes uh, which, in which the calculations are carried out and with the understanding that these notes are really informal, uh, I've not had a chance to adequately proofread them so they're not for circulation, but the details of some of the calculations that I'll only have time to just give you the uh, overview of are in these notes. Uh, that's true today and it's especially true uh, tomorrow when I'll discuss the, uh, the, uh, what was really the topic of Carriel's talk here in the fall, the details and some of the algebraic geometry and some of the Hodge theory that's behind that. Um, I think just on a personal note, um, automorphic cohomology uh, in the form that I'll be talking about it uh, here today and to some extent tomorrow, uh, originated as far as I know in the mid-1960s and at that time there were discussions with Bob Langlands where possible connections to representation theory emerged and those were later pursued quite successfully by Wilfred Schmidt and others. Uh, the sort of geometric uh, meaning of automorphic cohomology and the arithmetic meaning of it, uh, as far as I know, has re remained quite mysterious. Uh, you know, it arose originally from algebraic geometry, from Hodge theory, but seemed to have no particular geometric or arithmetic aspects to it until the uh, work of Carriol. The Objects I'll be talking about, which is the first one here, are homogeneous complex manifolds. And I will be almost exclusively concerned with what I will call the non-classical case. And a non-classical homogeneous complex manifold, I'll write the definition up in a minute, but a non-classical homogeneous complex manifold is one that does not fiber homo holomorphically over Hermitian symmetric space. So it's one that is in some way inaccessible to 
uh, much of the classical theory of automorphic forms that were done in the context of Shimura varieties and uh, things related to those. Okay. Automorphic cohomology will, for the, in this non-classical case, never be something that uh, is, is recognizable as automorphic forms in any classical sense. It's something different. It's cohomology in the middle range. And so to try to understand exactly what this object is, what it's good for, what its geometric properties, arithmetic properties are, is really the intent of, of these talks. Again, much of the material today, I think, is well known, certainly to experts. And I hope that uh, you will pardon my just going over familiar material. Uh, I think perhaps for some of the uh, more arithmetic algebraic geometers, uh, the complex analytic point of view may be something that uh, may not be so familiar and uh, hopefully will be of some interest. So the first topic are homogeneous complex manifolds. And just by way of notation, G is always going to be a reductive algebraic group over Q. Okay. It's a Q algebraic group that's reductive. And it's real and complex associated Lie groups. I'll just denote by this. And in the complex Lie group, there'll be a compact form that'll be denoted by that. Uh, so these are the groups that will enter. I will always assume that the real Lie group contains a compact maximal torus. And then you have the usual story that the Lie algebra, the Lie algebra here will just be denoted by that, and this will be the Lie algebra of the complex group. You have a decomposition into root spaces. This is the Cartan subalgebra, the complexified Lie algebra of the maximal torus, direct sum the root spaces, which here I'll denote by capital Phi uh, the set of roots. And these are the root spaces. This is sort of standard notation with also the convention that the root space for the negative of alpha is the conjugate relative to this compact form of the root space for alpha. The homogeneous complex manifolds will, description, there'll be uh, the real Lie group, uh, the coset space, the homogeneous space of the real Lie group, divided by a compact subgroup that contains the compact maximal torus. And there'll be two descriptions of them, of the complex structure. So this is a real manifold, and I want to describe two ways, equivalent ways, of giving it a complex structure. Okay. The first is to identify the complex tangent space at the identity coset, as usual with the quotient Lie algebra of these two groups. That's just the standard identification of the tangent space at the unit, at the identity coset in the homogeneous space. Because of this de decomposition, this can be written as the sum of the root spaces minus the root spaces for the subgroup, the compact subgroup. And at this point, one makes a choice of positive roots. And then the 1, 0 tangent space to the will be identified with the sum of the positive roots, take away the ones that are roots of the subgroup. Okay. The choice of positive roots is not unique. Uh, there's an equivalence among them, which I don't need to get into. But true, making one choice of positive roots identifies the one zero, tangent space of type one zero. You can think of it that choosing a set of positive roots gives an invariant almost complex structure on this manifold. And that almost complex structure is a decomposition of the complex tangent bundle into one zero part, so-called, and its conjugate. 
and this is the one zero part. This almost complex structure is integrable. Okay. And that means it's actually a complex structure. It's integrable because the sum of two positive roots, if it's a root, is again a positive root. So this is an integrable almost complex structure, and that defines an invariant complex structure on this real manifold. The alternate description is that these homogeneous complex manifolds always come with a dual. The dual will be of the form the complex group divided by a parabolic subgroup. Okay? And the dual is now going to be a projective, smooth projective algebraic variety. It's rational. It's in fact defined over Q. So the simplest picture is the usual upper half plane, that's D, sitting in the projective line, the Riemann sphere, that's D hat. Here, the isotropic group H is uh, the intersection of GR with a parabolic. And you can think of the Lie algebra of P as this is not the Lie algebra now of the Cartan decomposition in symmetric spaces. It's Lie algebra, the parabolic group, as given by H direct sum, the direct sum of the negative roots. Okay, so that's the Lie algebra of the parabolic group. So the quotient space of the complex Lie algebra by the Lie algebra of the parabolic group is just this one zero tangent space. Okay. The real Lie group operates uh, on this manifold, and we are interested in the open orbits that have compact isotropic group, and one of those will be this one here. So the alternate way of thinking of these homogeneous complex manifolds is as open orbits in these rational projective homogeneous spaces with compact isotropy group. And these are equivalent descriptions. Non-classical, as I said earlier, and these will be the ones that I will be concerned with is the same thing as saying that D does not fiber holomorphically, over a Hermitian symmetric domain. Or equivalently, the maximal compact subgroup, there's a unique maximal compact subgroup containing H, containing the maximal torus, and the complex structure, it could well happen that this is a Hermitian symmetric space, but the complex structure is not compatible with that on, on D. The map is not holomorphic. There's a pur purely root theoretic way of expressing this that I'll mention later. Okay. From a differential geometric point of view, this Homogeneous space is what's called a reductive homogeneous space. And what that means is that the real Lie algebra splits as a direct sum of the Lie algebra of H and a complement where the bracket <coughs> of H with Q. So this is an invariant under ad H decomposition okay. expressed by this condition. And what that means geometrically is that in the homogeneous space, the principal bundle from a differential geometric point of view, this is a principal bundle, and this means that there's an invariant connection in the principal bundle. A connection in a fiber bundle is a choice of horizontal space at each point with certain properties when you act on the right. It's invariant. Okay. 
And in fact, the complement Q is the orthogonal of H with respect to the killing form. This has one very important, uh, historically uh, very important consequence that the curvature in this principal bundle is given by a very simple formula. You take two tangent vectors at the identity coset. This is identified with the tangent space at the identity coset. Think of this as the vertical space here, and this is the horizontal space. And the curvature now is a two-form, differential form of degree two, with values in the Lie algebra of the group. In this case, the group is H. Okay, so you have to tell what a pair of vectors, the curvature, what what the curvature evaluates to on a pair of vectors, and you just bracket them and project them uh, into H. Carriol's work did not use Hodge theory uh, explicitly, but it certainly was used implicitly. And in the second, in the talk he gave here, it was actually used explicitly in the sense that he was looking at so-called limiting mixed Hodge structures okay, as a boundary component to quotients of these Ds by arithmetic groups. And to me, uh, I think framing things in sort of Hodge theoretic terms provides, uh, at least to me, a helpful context for the calculations Carriol did. And you can make some of the calculations, in fact, uh, more conceptual. Uh, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about Hodge theory and uh, the three basic examples will be uh, the three lowest dimensional non-classical uh, Hodge theoretic objects. Okay. So first, I need to say what a polarized Hodge structure is. It's given by the data, I'll write it this way, of V is a vector space over Q. Q is a non-degenerate bilinear form. Uh, Hodge polarized Hodge structures have weights, and the weight will always be n. In these talks, and Q is either alternating or symmetric, depending on whether n is odd or even. Okay. It's like uh, uh, and the phi is a mapping from a group that I'll explain in just a minute into the automorphisms of the real vector space. Uh, preserve, I'm sorry, it's the automorphisms of the real vector space uh, that has weight n. And here s is the group gotten by restricting scalars from C to R of C star. You just take multiplicative complex numbers, think of it as a real Lie group. So it's isomorphic to the circle across the positive reals. Okay. And the maximal compact subgroup is the circle 
weight n means that when you restrict it to the positive reals, it scales with a factor of n. So that phi of r is r to the n. Okay, so that's the scaling factor is the weight. Now, if you complexify and decompose phi into eigenspaces of this representation, it decomposes into something that's perhaps more familiar. Uh, a it's a Hodge decomposition into PQ spaces where VQP is the conjugate of VPQ. And phi of z is z to the p, z bar to the q on VPQ. In other words, you simply take the eigenspace decomposition of the complexification of this representation. Because the weight is n, the p plus q's all add up to n. And the eigenspaces occur in conjugate pairs because you started with a real representation. So this is the usual notion of a Hodge structure. The polarization condition is that the bilinear form that these spaces are mutually orthogonal except the conjugate ones pair in a non-degenerate Hermitian inner product. So I square root of minus 1 to the power of p minus q is this Hermitian form is positive definite. As examples of these homogeneous complex manifolds, uh, among the examples are the so-called period domains, D, which is the set of polarized Hodge structures on a given with fixed Hodge numbers usually denoted by HPQ, which is the dimensions of VPQ. Okay, so it's just a set of all polarized Hodge structures with fixed Hodge numbers. That can be seen to be a homogeneous complex manifold of the type that uh, was in the, uh, in the definition. So the first example is when the weight is 2. When weight is 1, uh, the period domain is the Ziegel upper half space, generalized upper half space. In weight 2, the period domain is a special orthogonal group divided by a unitary group. And here I'm taking VR oriented just to keep the groups connected. So this is the G, the real Lie group. Uh, the quadratic form in this case is a rational symmetric matrix. So the algebraic group is just the, the group preserving a indefinite quadratic form. And this is the, the well, this is the um, homogeneous space description. The dual can be thought of in the following way. It's the set of planes. Ah, it's non-classical. If A is at least 2. When A is 1, uh, you have these bounded symmetric domains of type 4 that can be <coughs> equivariantly embedded in the Ziegel space. 
and they're classical. This is the set of planes, A-dimensional planes in the Grassmannian of the complex vector space that satisfy the first bilinear relation. Okay. So it's simply a submanifold of a complex Grassmannian consisting of linear spaces of dimension A that lie on a quadric. D is given by the set of F's satisfying this and where Q of F, F bar is positive. Okay, that's the second bilinear relation in this case. I'm going to be particularly concerned in the case of SO4, comma 1 divided by U2. So these are polarized Hodge structures of weight 2 with the simplest non-classical Hodge numbers. H20 is 2 and H11 is 1. These arise algebra geometrically by a very special type of algebraic surface. Uh, they have to have um, a very large Picard number, a lot of algebraic cycles on them, okay. almost the maximum number. The second example is Hodge structures, polarized Hodge structures of weight 3, all of whose Hodge numbers are 1. In this case, the period domain is a symplectic group in four variables divided by a maximal torus. I'm sorry, yes, a maximal torus. Now, the symplectic group in four variables divided by the unitary group is Ziegel upper half space of uh, genus two or dimension two abelian varieties. You might ask, is the complex structure here, does it fiber holomorphically over this? And the answer is no. Okay, it does not fiber holomorphically. So this is non-classical. And the third example is the one that's studied by Cario and I think goes back to the work of, uh, at least to the work of Eastwood, Gendinkin, and Wong. I think Gendinkin is here with us. Uh, and arose in sort of representation theory and sort of, uh, sort of mathematical physics considerations. I'm going to give it in a Hodge theoretic setting. This is not how it arose initially. So here we start with V as a six dimensional vector space. F will be an imaginary quadratic number field, so D is a positive uh, rational number. And I want to make sure I get the notation straight. They'll be given an embedding of F in the endomorphisms over Q of V. We'll come to, we'll, we'll be given an alternating form. This is going to be polarized Hodge structures of weight 3, so there'll be an alternating form Q that will turn up in a minute. Okay, so V is, uh, there's an embedding of V in here, and that means when you tensor the vector space with F, it decomposes into conjugate eigenspaces. Okay. Each of these is three-dimensional. Right. And the polarized Hodge structures that we'll be considering will be of weight three. And the picture of them is this. The piece of the, this is the H30, or the V30, the V21 and so on, V12, V03. So the eight V30 part is in here when you complexify. The 21 part has one foot here and one foot here, 
and so on. Okay, in the notes, it's written down explicitly uh, in more detail what these are. So you notice here that the dimension is six. So you're on a six-dimensional vector space, and you have weight three. Uh, the action of the circle is also in the notes. Okay. The uh, set of polarized Hodge structures of this type is what I call a Mumford-Tate domain, and I'll explain the origin of this term in just a minute. But it sits in a period domain of all polarized Hodge structures of weight 3 with Hodge numbers 1, 2, 2, 1 as a subdomain, and you can think of it uh, as an orbit of a group, namely, uh, and I want to get my notation straight, I'll let GR, yeah, first there'll be uh, a Hermitian form defined on, uh, on V plus C. The complexification of this, this will be minus IQ of UV bar, where U and V are in here. Okay, so the alternating form, and there's a Hermitian form on this vector space are related in the following, in this way, and that gives you then a group whose real points are, are well, it's the unitary group for this Hermitian form of V plus C, this complex vector of this vector space. Okay. So the period domain is the orbit of this group in this period domain of a particular polarized Hodge structure is what this uh, homogeneous complex manifold is. As a homogeneous space, it's SU21, comma T. Right? Even though this group here is isomorphic to this really, I'm going to put a tilde on it. Um, I'll explain the notation in a minute. This is really a U21, a unitary group. And, but when you quotient by the maximal uh, torus, it's the same as taking the derived group and quotienting by the maximal torus there. So this is the homogeneous complex manifold. You can think of it, uh, Hodge theoretically, as you have this big set of polarized Hodge structures of weight 3. You have a special subset in those, and I'll describe Hodge theoretically how to think of that subset in a minute. Okay. The homogeneous space picture as a homogeneous complex manifold is the following. The compact dual is just P2 across the dual projective space. I'm sorry, it's the incidence correspondence in here. So this is the set of pairs, a point and a line, such that the point is on the line. And this contains D, which is described by, I always draw the picture, so the Hermitian form has signature, when you track, track it down, it has signature 2, 1. So it's a Hermitian form on C3 of signature 2, 1, defines then in C2, sitting in P2, a unit ball. Unit ball is going to be denoted by delta in these lectures. Okay. So you're looking in the compact dual at the subset of pairs consisting of a point on a line where the point is outside the unit ball, 
and the line intersects the ball. Okay. So P is on L, that's the incidence relation. P uh, does not belong to delta, and this thing intersects the ball. So that's the homogeneous complex manifold, it's something very explicit. There are three open orbits uh, in this case, and the other two are these. So this is the set of pairs of a point and a line where the point is in the ball, and the line, of course, has to meet the ball. And this is the set of pairs, a point on the line, both outside the ball. Okay. This is classical because this fibers over the ball by sending this to the point. Okay. So you have these three open orbits of SU21 operating on this incidence, this projective variety, and two of them are classical. This one and this one, this one, you just send it to the line. Okay, so this maps down to what I'm going to call delta star, which is the set of lines in P2 that don't meet the ball. It's somehow the dual of the ball. Okay. So there are two classical open orbits and the non-classical one, which will be the one of primary interest here. I think because of the interest of time, um, I'm not going to recall the definition of Mumford-Tate groups and Mumford-Tate domains. They play a central pro role in this story from a Hodge theoretic point of view. Uh, this D here is a Mumford-Tate domain consisting of polarized Hodge structures whose generic point has as Mumford-Tate group the U21 which is smaller than the symplectic group, sp6. So it means the Hodge structures have additional uh, symmetries. Um, the definition and some references are given in the notes, but I think I'm going to uh, not do that here. When uh, these uh, homogeneous complex manifolds first arose, uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to that later. The second topic is the homogeneous vector bundles. This is a shorter topic. Um, Actually, I think I will make that remark because it's relevant. And I'll do the homogeneous bundles. When these Ds, the non-classical homogeneous complex manifolds as period domains first arose, there was a question of There was a question as to whether quotients by arithmetic groups were algebraic varieties. The classical ones are. But the non-classical ones, this was a, uh, a question that arose early, and for reasons that I'll explain when I talk about cohomology, they certainly didn't smell like algebraic varieties. There was no natural way to construct rational functions on them. 
but they still might be algebraic varieties in some strange way. Uh, it was proved some years later that if D is non-classical uh, period domain of weight two, then assuming that X is uh, compact, X does not have the homotopy type of a compact Taylor manifold. In particular, is not an algebraic variety. It's proved by Carlson and Toledo. And here I'm assuming that gamma operates without fixed points with compact quotient. Okay. An open question, as far as I know to this day, is if D is, is non-classical, uh, does that imply that X is not an algebraic variety? Uh, you know, no one has ever constructed any meromorphic functions on this, but it doesn't mean that they aren't there. Okay. So in particular, uh, if we factor the non-classical uh, SU21 divided by the maximal torus by the obvious arithmetic group, right, it's just the matrices with values in F, it's not known if that object is an algebraic variety. It's not known as to me. You're not going to get by with this type of result because if you have odd weight, then uh, the Com these compact quotients do have the homotopy type of an algebraic variety, okay? Because they're symplectic groups factored by things that are contained in a maximal compact subgroup. Okay, so this sort of result can't be true in general, but this could be. It's the non-algebra geometric character of these non-classical things that, to me, it was so interesting to see the way that uh, they have very rich structure geometrically and arithmetically, but it doesn't come about in uh, what I guess is the standard way. And so that's part of what I'll <laughs> try to explain. Excuse me? You're not expecting to be No, no. I mean, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a conjecture if you want, or at least a plausible conjecture. It's a pseudo-concavity issue because if you had non-constant meromorphic functions, these things have pseudo-concavity. Uh, so in the compact dual, any rational function on the quotient when lifted to the D would tend to extend to a rational function on the compact dual, but they're not invariant under the, the group. So that's, that's the plausibility argument. Homogeneous vector bundles are what you think they should be. You have a homogeneous space. It's a vector bundle over it to which the action of the group lifts. So these are given by taking a representation of this into the automorphisms of a complex vector space and forming the quotient by the equivalence relation where H acts on the right here and acts on the left here. And you acts on the right by the inverse and on the, of the element on the, and here by the element in the group. Okay. We're going to be particularly interested in holomorphic homogeneous vector bundles. So that will mean that they're uh, 
that there's a homogeneous vector bundle here, which is GC across the parabolic group operating on E by a holomorphic representation, It'll always be algebraic, in fact. So this is an algebraic vector bundle, in particular holomorphic, and it's the restriction of these to D that will be the homogeneous vector bundles of interest. Okay. So examples are the Hodge bundles. First, the Hodge filtration bundles. Well, over D, just the Hodge bundles. That's the bundle, vector bundle, whose fiber at each point is just in the Hodge decomposition, the VPQ component. Now, there are Hodge filtrations associated to a Hodge structure. And the parabolic group operates on, uh, on these vector spaces. It does not operate on, does not preserve the Hodge decomposition, but it does preserve the Hodge filtration at the origin. Okay. So the Hodge filtration bundles give holomorphic vector bundles over the dual, and the successive quotients of the Hodge filtration bundles pick out the pieces in the Hodge decomposition and give the Hodge bundles here. These Hodge bundles have Hermitian metrics given by the second of the two bilinear relations, invariant under the group. Okay. If you just think about it, uh, the group that preserves the Hodge decomposition is a product of unitary groups in odd weight and unitary groups and an orthogonal group. Uh, in even weight, and it preserves the quadratic form Q, so it preserves those Hermitian forms. So the Hodge bundles have Hermitian metrics. So they're holomorphic Hermitian vector bundles. The tangent bundle also to D, holomorphic tangent bundle is a homogeneous vector bundle. In fact, it's constructed uh, as a subbundle of the homomorphisms from the Hodge bundle to the quotients of the Hodge bundle. The usual way of identifying the tangent space to a Grassmannian with the homomorphisms of the linear space to the quotient space, of the subspace to the quotient space. Now, whenever you have a holomorphic vector bundle with a Hermitian metric, it's a uh, very basic and standard fact in differential geometry that there's a canonical connection with the property that the zero one part of the connection is the D-bar operator that gives the complex structure. And it preserves the metric. If you take two sections, the connection goes, it's like in Riemannian geometry. So Hermitian vector bundles have canonical metrics. And since they are homogeneous vector bundles associated to a representation, you have a connection that's induced from the connection as a reductive homogeneous space. So a basic fact is that the reductive connection in this induces the uh, Hermitian connection. In any Hermitian vector bundle, homogeneous Hermitian vector bundle, that is a holomorphic vector bundle such that you have an invariant Hermitian form the prime examples of these being the Hodge bundles and the tangent bundle. Okay. So in particular, there's a very nice formula for the curvature
which comes from the curvature formula in the uh, principal bundle. The curvature in this evaluated on a pair of tangent vectors is just the representation applied to the bracket, the h part of that. Okay. Just to take the induced representation on the Lie algebra and that gives you an endomorphism E valued two form, which is the curvature. This is the basic formula for the curvature of Hermitian homogeneous vector bundles. And it's the particular form that that takes when you write it out in terms of roots, uh, in terms of roots and separating the compact and non-compact roots that controls the geometric properties of these uh, non-classical domains and their quotients. The next topic is the passage to flag manifolds. And whenever you have one of these homogeneous complex manifolds, there's an associated what we'll call flag manifold lying over the homogeneous manifold just gotten by taking uh, you factor by the maximal torus. Now I said we made a choice of positive roots. A choice of positive roots gives an invariant complex structure here. Okay. And the choice of positive roots that gives the complex structure here should be compatible with the one here. So this is the associated flag manifold. It's not unique because there'll be several choices of positive roots that uh, will give the same complex structure here, but different complex structures here, but you choose one for, you know, there'll be obvious ones in our examples. So if you go back, for example, to uh, the period domain for weight two polarized Hodge structures, then that's the SO4 one by U2 example. Here the points are Hodge flags. These are subspaces of these dimensions and with a property that Q of F22 is zero and that uh, F3 is F2 perp and F4 is the orthogonal complement of F1. So this is what is meant by a Hodge flag. It's simply a flag in the usual sense on a vector space but with the conditions imposed by the bilinear, first bilinear relation. Okay. So uh, and then they have the second bilinear relation, you have to put that in. And the map here simply sends this to F, which is F2. Okay. So in Hodge filtration terms, you have F2 containing F1, which is F2 perp, uh, yeah, contained in contained in the whole vector space. So that would be this, contained in this, contained in that. Working on the flag manifolds from a representation theoretic point of view, and in many ways from a geometric point of view, is more convenient because there uh, all the characters of the torus give holomorphic uh, Hermitian line bundles, the unitary characters. So you can really work with line bundles here. Down here, the more natural objects, or not more natural, but natural objects are not just the line bundles, but the vector bundles, like the Hodge bundles. The way to get back and forth between these is uh, if you use the Larray spectral sequence for this vibration and the Borel-Weil-Bott theorem. Borel-Weil-Bott theorem gives you a very precise description on a compact homogeneous space of the cohomology of homogeneous uh, vector bundles. Okay. So uh, in principle, it's sufficient always to work up here. Keeping the notations and the indices straight is another matter, but at least in principle, uh, 
it's sufficient to work on, on the flag manifolds. So that's what we'll do, is pretty much throughout, stick to the flag manifolds. So in particular, given a, a weight That is something that's in the dual Lie algebra or the imaginary linear functional on the dual of the Lie algebra of the maximal torus satisfying integrality conditions. It induces a character of the maximal torus and that gives you a homogeneous line bundle. And it's these that we'll be interested in, these line bundles. I'm going to drop the T now because we're always, unless I say otherwise, going to be on flag manifolds. It's the cohomology of these uh, and on quotients by arithmetic groups that we're interested in. So we're interested in these types of results. I'm going to use L2 cohomology. Every all the spaces will have invariant metrics, the bundles will have invariant metrics, and the conditions needed to make a good theory of square integrable cohomology are satisfied. All right, that is, you have to have some condition on the links of vectors against the distances on the manifold as you go to the boundary to have a good L2 theory. But L2 cohomology means you just take square integrable differential forms and take the D-bar cohomology of those in some sense. We'll be interested in this and in ordinary cohomology. And the same thing on compact, on quotients by arithmetic groups. And I'll always call those X. I'll put a Q here. The two types of results that we're going to be interested in are when these groups are zero and when these groups are non-zero. And can you could prove that they are non-zero, they exist. So classically, you'd be looking at H0 of these homogeneous line bundles over quotients of bounded symmetric domains. And those would be automorphic forms in some classical sense. Or by duality, cohomology in the top dimension. We're going to be interested in the cohomology in the intermediate dimensions in cases where there is nothing in the top and bottom dimensions. The way the curvature enters the picture is uh, this way, that suppose you have a line bundle over a compact complex manifold, so a holomorphic line bundle over a compact complex manifold, and suppose you have a Hermitian metric whose curvature So in a line bundle, the curvature is a differential form of type 1,1. One, one. It's a two-form of type 1,1. One, one. So it's a Hermitian form in each tangent space. The curvature should be non-degenerate. And of signature. Uh, dimension of x minus p, p. That means it has p negative eigenvalues and the remaining eigenvalues are positive. So it's a Hermitian form, indefinite, with this many negative eigenvalues. Then there are two general results. The first is that the cohomology 
of tensor powers is zero for Q not equal to P and K big enough. So you have vanishing of cohomology in all dimensions except one, that one being the number of negative eigenvalues. You can do it with L2 also. Yeah. I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute. The second one, the reason I'm doing a compact quotient here is because of the second statement, that the dimension here by the Hirzebrug-Atiyah-Singer theorem can be computed. All the groups except one are zero. The Euler characteristic is given by the topological formula in the Atiyah-Singer theorem. And in the case where we're going to be interested, which will be when x is a quotient, you're going to have a positive constant times the volume of the quotient times k to the power dimension of x plus lower order terms in k. So it's like a Hilbert polynomial whose leading term is the k to the dimension x power. And this is a constant independent of, of gamma, of the discrete group. So the discrete group will enter into the picture in terms of the volume only, which is the, you know, it's what you expect from classical case also. But the point is here, uh, this is some intermediate cohomology group because of the following elementary but non-trivial fact that I'll come to later on, but I'll say that what it's going to give you, that P can be chosen to be zero in this statement here implies that D is non-classical, is classical. So what this means is if you're in the non-classical case, you've got a lot of cohomology, but none of it is sections of the bundle or the dual of that. The same statement here is true in L2 cohomology. Here, if you take an arithmetic group, it's not even known, as far as I know, that this is a finite dimensional vector space. So that's a question. In the non-classical case uh, with gamma and arithmetic group, is this finite dimensional? Compact quotient. Not necessarily. If it's compact, then it's finite dimensional. Uh, oh, so this is a but if it's arithmetic, which is the ones we'll be interested in, it's finite volume. And tomorrow I'll be discussing what the boundaries look like in the, in the non-classical case. Okay. L2, So as I said in the beginning, uh, well, let me, let me finish the next part and then I'll come back to that. So going back to our homogeneous line bundles, L lambda there, uh, we know that the, um, they're Hermitian holomorphic homogeneous bundles. So you can ask first, is the curvature non-degenerate? And secondly, if so, what is its signature? So the statement then is first that if lambda is non-singular, 
that implies that the curvature, I'm going to call it omega lambda, is non-degenerate. So the weight being non-singular means it's not on the, a, 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 the wall of a vial chamber, or it's not orthogonal to any root. Okay. And the integer p, I'm going to call it p of lambda, is the following. It's the number of positive non-compact roots. And here I should remark that there's a unique maximal compact subgroup containing H. Okay. So we know what the compact and the non-compact roots are. It's the number of non-compact roots where this is positive plus the number of compact roots where this is negative. Okay. So the, yeah, that's the inner product of lambda with B. Beta, beta is a, non -com is a compact root. This is a non-compact root. The geometric meaning of this uh, is the following. Let's take something in the positive vial chamber. So this is positive, and uh, these are all positive. So you only have this number here. Okay. So this p of lambda is the number of non-compact roots. And what these, the formula is saying, the curvature formula, is that if you fiber d over the Riemannian symmetric space, in the horizontal directions for this vibration, the curvature form is positive. In the vertical directions, it's negative. So that's the sort of geometric meaning of this. And in particular, then, this p of lambda, the thing I said a minute ago, p of lambda equals 0 for some lambda, non-singular lambda, implies that d is classical. Excuse me? The vanishing theorem is the Bachner argument. Um, you know, it, and um, this is an argument. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, an argument using the root structure. So Schmidt's results. Uh, coming to that, and that was dealing with realizing, this was Langland's uh, original conjecture, the realization of the discrete series as L2 cohomology. And a special case of Schmidt's results uh, are as follows, that the cohomology L2 cohomology of D with coefficients in L lambda is 0 for Q not equal to P of lambda plus rho. And here is this magical rho that always comes in, 1 half the sum of the positive roots. It comes in, it's forced on you by uh, duality. So for Q not equal to this P of lambda plus rho, L2 cohomology is zero. You don't have to take very high powers here. The result is, is precise. And the second part is that HP of lambda plus rho. This is acted on by the real group because it acts on the domain. It acts on the line bundle unitarily. It acts on the cohomology. L2 cohomology, that this is the discrete series representation with Harishandra character in the standard notation theta of lambda plus rho. So it's the realization of the discrete series as L2 cohomology. Okay. I'm going to draw a few pictures uh, to show where 
uh, cohomology does and does not occur in the class in these examples. There are many more pictures in the notes. I'll just draw, I guess, first the SO4, comma 1 one. The compact roots have a box around them. These are the vial chambers. These are the positive roots. So this is the positive vial chamber. This is slightly non-standard choice of a positive vial chamber. Um, it comes from Hodge theoretic considerations. So uh, it may look a little unfamiliar if you look in the you know, standard references. And where the, uh, this, uh, where the uh, L2 cohomology occurs is in degree 1, degree 2, degree 3, degree 2, degree 1, degree 2, and here degree 2 with a circle. So the L2 cohomology occurs in all degrees except 0 and 4. The dimension is 4. Okay. And we'll see a similar result for where the cohomology, the automorphic cohomology and quotients by gamma occur. You notice you never get a zero here. The reason for the circled one, have I got the, the right vial chamber? No, I have the wrong vial chamber. Should be that one there. Positive, positive, positive. Is that right? Positive, 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 positive. Yeah, that's right. And the next two pictures I'll do are the SU2, comma, 1. Excuse me? The reason for the circle uh, is in a minute I'm going to talk about when L2 cohomology and ordinary sheaf cohomology line up. Okay. There's always a mapping from L2 cohomology to ordinary cohomology, but it generally has no particular properties. There's exactly one uh, degree, one choice of vial chamber where it does line up. And that's what gives you the geometric way of doing the K-type of the discrete series. So if you want to compute the n cohomology by using the expansion into k-type, this is a geometric way of doing it. It's not the way Curiel did it. It's, this is, I think, to me, simpler. Okay. So for SU2, comma 1, There are two compact roots. This is non-classical. Uh, and this is the positive vial chamber. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was doing SP. These are the non-compact roots. And the positive vial chamber I've got here. These are the positive roots. And the numbers are 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, and it should be 2, 1. The numbers in opposite vial chambers always add up to the dimension. That's duality. And classical. is this picture. And here we get a zero. 
and here's the three. These are the positive roots there. And here we get a one, and here we get a two, and the positive vowel chamber is this one. And here's a two and a one. Three and zero, two and one, yeah. Um, so here you get actually H zero. You get square interval holomorphic sections. That's a classical phenomenon. The reason that I've singled out this one here, that it's an H1, is that when you use borel v bot the H1 uh, on the, um, uh, this is in the classical case, the H1 on the G by T becomes an H0 on the G by K. Right. The signs work out exactly so that you're getting holomorphic sections on the Hermitian symmetric space from the H1 here via Borel v. Bott. Okay. In other words, the line bundle is negative on the P1 fibers. When you fiber this um, classical, um, that's the D prime over here, you fiber it over uh, the unit ball. The P1s are fibers. And H1 upstairs by Varel Bevat evaluated on the fibers gives you H0 of something down below. So that's why, okay, that number is there. I think, in the interest of time, because um, I'm not going to get, certainly not through this. I'm going to leave this aside and just say what I need from it. It's in the notes. And just say what I need from it tomorrow. Um, that's probably, I think, more familiar uh, to many of you than the next two topics. And so uh, I want to talk about those cycle spaces, the uses of cycle spaces, and the correspondence spaces. So historically, uh, the question was, um, once you know that you're stuck with this cohomology in intermediate degrees, either on D or quotients, uh, how can you understand it? And the first attempt was by use of what are called cycle spaces. Uh, in fact, there's a very nice book about these uh, that was written by uh, Fells, Huckleberry, and Wolf that came out three, four years ago. Um, this starts from the observation that for D non-classical, there are always maximal compact subvarieties. positive dimensional, maximal compact subvarieties. And I'm going to use the, I'll, I'll pick a reference one in a minute, uh, in D. And in fact, once you've chosen your reference point in the homogeneous space, Z naught, which is K by H, or if you're in a flag case, K by T, is a complex, compact, complex analytic subvariety. Okay. So, for example, for the polarized Hodge structures of weight two, uh, with Hodge numbers two, H two zero is two. 
Remember there, the conditions are that you have points in the Grassmannian of two planes in a five-dimensional vector space. Q of F, F is zero, and Q of F, F bar is positive. Okay. So to get a, comp a po positive dimensional uh, compact subvariety to C1, uh, you do as follows. You take a reference, F0, and direct sum its conjugate, and call that E0. That's a C4 and C5. So you have a five-dimensional complex vector space, a hyper hyperplane in it. And you look at the set of F belonging to the Grassmannian of two planes in E0, in this C4 sitting in C5, that satisfy our Q of F, F is zero. What you'll find by linear algebra is if you have this relation, this implies that Q of F, F, is, F bar is positive. You only need the first one in this case. It's an elementary linear algebra argument. So geometrically, it's a very beautiful story that you have a four-dimensional vector space, or if you projectivize it, you have a P3. And if you restrict this quadratic form to this hyperplane, you have a quadric, you know, one of these things, in a three-dimensional projective space. You're looking at two planes in E0, which is the same thing as lines in P3, and you're looking at lines that lie on a quadric. And because I've oriented the vector space, you'll be picking out the lines that lie on one of the two sets of rulings. So the maximal compact subvariety is just all the lines that are in one of the two rulings here. So it's a P1 in this case. Well, once you have one maximal compact subvariety, you have a lot because you can move them around by the complex group. Or really what you should do, this is a standard notation, script Z is the Hilbert scheme of this reference one in D hat, and I'll write it intersect D. So you look at the Hilbert scheme of this uh, a subvariety of a projective variety. That's a set of subvarieties that like your deformations of your original one, if you like. Look at that subset that lies inside the domain. Okay, that's what this notation means. This is the definition of the cycle space. For us, the thing that's going to be more convenient is not the full cycle space, but the set of translates by elements of the complex group that leave the reference one inside D. Okay, so you translate by the complex group this compact subvariety, and as long as it stays inside this domain, and we'll call that U. It's a subset of the Hilbert scheme thing. Okay. There's a very nice description of this U, that U is an open set in this affine variety. This is the complex group and the complexification of the maximal compact subgroup. This is true if and only if D is non-classical. It's more complicated, interestingly, in the classical case. I mean, the way to see that it's more complicated is take the case of a Hermitian symmetric space. Then the compact subvarieties are just points. And the subgroup that translates a point in the Hermitian symmetric space and leaves it inside the Hermitian symmetric domain is a parabolic subgroup. 
So it's not the complexification of the maximal compact subgroup. So it's that phenomenon. Anyway, this, in the non-classical case, you have this U sitting very nicely in this affine algebraic variety, and it's a Stein manifold. The, uh, let me, well, let me do with the second example. Excuse me? We get some not even the exhaust from the sun somewhere? For the SU2, comma, 1 example, uh, you can draw the picture of this U. And the picture of U is the following. It consists of these objects. So U is isomorphic to the ball across the dual of the ball. Points in the ball, lines not meeting the ball. Okay, That's what the U is. Each point of U is supposed to give you a compact subvariety of D. Okay. And the way you do that is you simply draw all these pictures, little p and little l. You take all the lines through p, where they meet l gives you the little p and the line l. And remember that, capital, that rd was the set of p l's, where p is outside the ball and l meets the ball. So the p1 of lines through a point in the ball gives you a compact subvariety. Okay. That's the description, and this exhibits the thing as a Stein manifold. The uses of this cycle space, so this is the, um, uh, the next topic, <coughs> um, are as follows that for lambda plus rho anti-dominant, so those were the opposites of the vial chambers in those pictures I drew. The P of lambda plus rho is the dimension of the maximal compact subvariety. Okay. So this, this magic number where the L2 cohomology occurs is exactly the dimension of the maximal compact subvariety. And what that suggests is that you take the L2 cohomology You map that to ordinary cohomology, and you can then restrict that to top degree cohomology. I'll just call that D, just to keep the notation simpler. Top degree cohomology on this compact subvariety. Then you can take the kernel of this map that maps to HD of Z naught L lambda tensor the dual of a normal bundle. That's the ideal sheaf modulo its square. So in other words, what we're doing is taking cohomology and expanding it around this maximal compact subvariety by first restricting it, then the stuff in the kernel is in the ideal sheaf times the line bundle. You can restrict that, and that sends you here. The next time you go to L lambda tends to second symmetric product of the dual normal bundle. Okay. So you're expanding cohomology about a compact complex manifold. Schmidt proved that this image here is injective 
and has, is dense. There's a natural topology here. So you're capturing the discrete series. I should have said also that there's one more piece to the story. Well, uh, I'll just say verbally. You can continue this process you looking at the square of the ideal sheaf and the higher powers of the ideal sheaf. And the piece that I'm not going to write up is that this captures everything. It's injective. So you don't lose any cohomology by this formal power series expansion around this maximal compact subvariety. Okay. These maximal compact subvarieties, the Z as a compact complex manifold is K by T, say, if we're in the case of the flag domain. So these, that gives you the K expansion of the discrete series. And of some limits of discrete series. And I'm not sure how general that is, but in Carroll's case, it works for the degenerate limit that he uses. So it gives the K expansion of the discrete series. I'll explain to Mar just how that works in Carriel's case. Um, and it's a calculation, as I say, he did uh, by a sort of uh, very explicit knowledge of what the degenerate limits of discrete series were in terms of spherical harmonics. Uh, you know, they were actually functions on the three sphere. Um, and it's an ingenious calculation, but if you do it this way, it's very geometric. It just comes, it comes out trivially from the end cohomology. So that's one use of these uh, cycle spaces. Is, is this what was in Schmidt's thesis that was not unpublished for a very long time? Excuse me? Is this what was in Schmidt's thesis that was unpublished? This is, goes back to Schmidt's thesis, yeah. Why do you introduce a whole cycle space instead of just the immersion? Excuse me? Ah, the use of the whole cycle space is that you can take, uh, say, the cohomology, L2 cohomology, and map that to sections over the whole cycle space of a vector bundle, where the fibers of the vector bundle at a point U are the top dimensional cohomology of the cycle uh, for the line bundle. In other words, you, sort of geometrically, the picture is something like this, that you have this family of compact subvarieties. You look at the parameter space, and you get a, first you get a vector bundle of the parameter space whose fibers are the top dimensional cohomology groups of the compact subvariety. And then cohomology here maps to sections here. And everything in sight has metrics, and so L2 sections go to L2 sections here. And another part of Schmidt's story was that there's a homogeneous differential operator, which he called P, over the cycle space. So that's that the image of this map is exactly the kernel of P. So you realize the discrete series now not as L2 cohomology, but as L2 sections of a vector bundle satisfying a linear first order partial differential operator. That's why you use the whole cycle space. Okay. So it's another non-complex analytic realization of the discrete series. Okay. Excuse me? First order, linear, um, yeah. It's really bigger, yeah, definitely bigger. And I mean, that is in Wolf, that book I mentioned. I didn't realize this fact that it's an if and only if that you have this nice picture if it's non-classical. So uh, that brings us up to the correspondent spaces and these topics, which I will go over uh, tomorrow. I'll just, I think, uh, um, 
I'll just briefly touch on those. They're discussed in the notes here. To close, I'll just say that the cycle spaces were around also for some time. Uh, but outside of realization of the discrete series, um, it, you know, it wasn't clear what they were good for. Uh, one needs something that's richer than the cycle spaces, which I'll call correspondence spaces. And I guess an indication of what's wrong with the cycle spaces, why they don't have enough information in them, is if you go back to these Mumford-Tate domains, then they have a very rich arithmetic structure. Right? They parameterize polarized Hodge structures. And in there, you have the CM points, the complex multiplication Hodge structures. Okay? It's a very rich family or set sitting in there, arithmetically defined. And the cycle spaces don't pick up the arithmetic that's in these uh, homogeneous complex manifolds because you can't have a whole compact analytic subvariety consisting of CM points. Okay? You need something that's a refinement of the cycle spaces that I'll call correspondence spaces, which will pick up not just the ability to convert higher cohomology into sections, but we'll also keep in track of the arithmetic. And those are the correspondence spaces. Okay. So I'll start with that tomorrow. <laughs>